I'll start. I'll start there. There you go. All right, so I'm gonna talk about glaucoma in general because glaucoma really is just a word that means damage to the eye from pressure. And it manifests slightly differently in very young children below the age of three compared to everybody else. Um, and it's characterized by optic nerve damage, visual field changes, and typically um, in, in the context of Serge Weber, elevated, elevated intraocular pressure. Um, there are many ways that people can have glaucoma, um, not just Sturge Weber, a one in 11 um, adults in the population as they get older into their 60s, 70s, and 80s will develop primary open angle glaucoma and glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide. So regardless of the risk related to the port one birthmark, um, it's, a, it's a fairly common problem that affects the, convert, uh, the, the population. And all it means is damage from pressure. So you can have high pressure without damage. That's not technically glaucoma yet, but once we see evidence of damage to the optic nerve or damage to the eye or change in the visual field, that's uh, considered glaucoma. Glaucoma is a, basically a plumbing issue and the, it's the front part of the eye um, that controls the, the plumbing um, kind of fluid production and fluid outflow of the aqueous humor, which is the fluid that fills the front part of the eye. Um, these are just some basic um, uh, facts about how quickly it's made. And if you were to drain the entire front part of the eye, it would take about 90 minutes for it to reform. Um, and this is what that looks like. So let me pull up my pointer. I think you guys can see my mouse now. You can see here's a cross section of an eyeball. And you can see that the scleral shell, that white part of the eyeball goes all the way back and there's only one opening where the optic nerve goes out, collecting all those nerve fibers to take those signals to the back of the brain so we can see what we can see. The front part of the eye is the cornea, that's the clear part. And then there's a space between the cornea and the iris, the colored part of the eye where your pupil is that where the fluid is produced and then comes through and then drains out of that pathway. And that's kind of where I spend 90% of my time, you know, thinking about patients is what's the problem with this fluid production and then the fluid outflow. In a Sturge Weber patient, what happens is this very thinly drawn line, you can barely see it even on my screen, Underneath the retina is called the choroid, and that's the choroid vasculature. You can see it here. It's that pinkish layer. Well, in Sturge Weber and in port wine birthmarks, that gets very congested and involved with the hemangioma. We call it a hemangioma. It's not really a hemangioma, but it's a vascular malformation. And that causes congestion both behind the retina and also in this outflow pathway for when the fluid drains through that tiny, tiny little drainage system that has to get into the venous channels and out through those channels into the lymphatics. So the hemangioma ends up like congesting the whole thing. So the best way to think about it is really to think about having, oh, let's see if I lost my, um, so that's just a, a, a closer up view at the bottom of the screen of the pathway in red of the fluid going out of the system. And this is just what it looks like under a microscope um, in normal scenario, but this is, this is really kind of the concept is that the eye produces fluid and then it has to drain the fluid. So if there's in most glaucoma patients, the resistance to drainage is at the drainage system of the eye in that little space where the iris meets the sclera, the color part of the eye meets the sclera. Um, and that's typically where the resistance is. But in a Serge Weber patient, you actually have a backup in the system. So the backstop in the system is the pressure is higher. So there's not as, you can't get the fluid out as well. In Sturge Weber, things happen in two ways. So when they're really young, that drainage system of the eye, right where we call it the angle, the trabecular meshwork, where the iris meets the white part of the eye doesn't form properly and it's not draining properly. And then the other component, which typically affects them when they get older into their twenties and thirties typically is this backstop pressure from the hemangioma expanding. Um, so it's, it's really just fluid in, fluid out. The problem is, is that it all compresses down on the optic nerve in the back. And this is just to tell you that, that people don't know that they have glaucoma unless they're being checked regularly, because if the glaucoma, if the pressure goes up really quickly, 
um, which you can see in the babies. And you can see in this lady who has a different type of glaucoma, you can see that her eye is red. It looks painful. It's cloudy. Um, and it, and, and they're uncomfortable because their pressure went from 14 to 60. They're in pain. But typically what happens as people get older and the eye doesn't kind of stretch as much and doesn't distend um, and get bigger, they get kind of a chronic raising of the pressure. And that's the problem. That's why everybody needs to be checked for glaucoma if they have a port wine stain that involves the top half of the face because those children and then those adults are not going to feel that the pressure is, very rarely would they feel that the pressure is very high. Um, there are hereditary and genetic factors for primary open angle glaucoma or POAG. This is the more common type of glaucoma. So if you have, a, if you or your child are part of a family that has a glaucoma history, all the more important that they're watched as well, because um, the, the, um, the, the, the risk is, is much higher in first degree relatives of people who have glaucoma. So if a parent went blind from glaucoma or grandparent went blind from glaucoma, then regardless of whether anybody in the family has a birthmark, you guys still need to be screened for glaucoma. And when we talk about glaucoma, there are two basic types. There's open angle. So that drainage system that I showed you that, that causes the, where the, where the eye drains the fluid is open or there's closed where the iris kind of pops up into it. And both of those can be caused either primarily, meaning there's nothing else we can find that's causing the problem or secondarily. Um, Serge Weber is kind of a form of secondary glaucoma. Um, and then there's closed, glau closed angle glaucoma as well. This is how we determine and how we actually look at that drainage system of the eyes using a tiny little mirror to figure out if it's open or closed. And I'm just gonna move the screen of everybody's faces over to the side so I can make sure I show you what I'm looking at here. Um, this is a picture of that drainage system right where the iris here inserts into the wall of the eye. And you can see that white stripe of the scleral spur, that's the sclera. So that is that angle, that drainage system, that's where the fluid goes out. And so you can see the top here, there's a lot of scarring and you don't see that nice white stripe as well. And then down here, you can see it better. So that's an, a closed angle and an open angle. And I just wanted to tell you the terminology. You might see all of these abbreviations. I'm just bringing it up because when you start looking at glaucoma and glaucoma information, even though it's all glaucoma, it's all damage to the optic nerve, everybody gets there a different way. So there's primary open angle glaucoma, there are open angle suspects, there's normal or low tension glaucoma where they have glaucoma with not, without having high pressure. You have juvenile open angle glaucoma, which is open angle glaucoma that's much more aggressive and typically happens in adolescence. Um, there are other genetic forms of glaucoma that are fairly prevalent in the population like pseudoexfoliation or pigment dispersion or glaucoma after trauma. Narrow or closed angle glaucoma are also genetically uh, associated. So um, angle closure, particularly in Hispanic, Southeast Asian and uh, Indian populations, these are kind of a mechanical form of glaucoma and um, something else to be looking for. So the reason why I show this is just to show you how many different types of glaucoma there are. And the fact that when I see a patient, just because they have a port wine stain, I always look at both sides to make sure, because it's so prevalent in the population anyway, you don't want to miss something else that's an overlay or in the other eye um, that we presume to be healthy. All different kinds of glaucoma. All right. So how do we figure out if someone has pediatric glaucoma? Well, these are the criteria that we came up with in the World Glaucoma um, Congress consensus a statement in 2013, and you have to have more than two of the above. So the big thing is under the age of three, the actual eye will stretch with high pressure. The eye gets bigger. Okay. It doesn't happen after three years old. You just end up pressing down on the optic nerve. So pressure is one component um, because the eye is getting bigger, they get more nearsighted. So a myopic shift, myopia means nearsighted or an increased size of the eyeball. These are all things we would measure on a child, usually in the operating room. Sometimes with a, rarely, I would say with a cooperative child, we can get what we need in clinic. Um, the Childhood Glaucoma Research Network has come up with these criteria and um, these different, again, categories of pediatric glaucoma. This is just to show you all the different ways you can end up at the same issue. 
But the big thing in any child under the age of three is what we call buphthalmus. And you can see a nice picture there of what I'm talking about in this child with unilateral glaucoma of the right eye. This is not a Serge Weber patient. This is a primary congenital, but it looks the same. The child's less than three, the pressure gets high and the eye swells up like a balloon, okay? Um, often it's accompanied by pain or light sensitivity or even a haziness to the front part of the eye like you saw in the picture of the lady I showed you earlier because the cornea is swollen, okay? So we look for things, we measure them, we look for asymmetry. Um, in somebody who has a port wine birthmark, if you start to see that the eye is looking bigger than the other eye, we need to see them fairly quickly. And often we'll take them for an exam in the operating room to confirm the diagnosis and then do some surgery. This is what we talk about when we talk about Hobbstria. You may see this in some of your searches online. There are basically stretch marks in the cornea. And this is a picture in retro illumination. It's just, you know, like when you get a red reflex in a camera and you get a red pupil, that's what this is. So it's, it's that light reflecting back. So you can see those stretch marks in this cornea of a child with glaucoma. We measure axial length. We measure the size of the eyeball. And this is an axial length age growth chart. We even have this, like we have height, weight growth charts. We have eyeball size growth charts. And I use this fairly commonly. You can see in this child um, to monitor their progress. You can see that the right eye, I would say ocular, dexter, and aqui. So we like to hold on to our Greek and Latin and ophthalmology. So on the right, on the, in the right eye, you can see she had, she was getting bigger. She had surgery and then she plateaued out and was very stable, but you can see that that left eye misbehaved. It, it was getting bigger. We did surgery. It got better, it stabilized, and then went up again. And so she needed more surgery. This is a patient with a, um, a Serge Weber. Um, it's almost always unilateral, but it can be um, bilateral. There was a recent paper out of uh, Korea that tried to map the um, risk of glaucoma based on the on the location of the birthmark. And what we used to think was if you had lower light involvement, you were less at risk, but that not does not appear to be the case, at least in a Korean population. So I've taken to looking a lot more closely at the babies that have kind of what we call the V2 distribution, the mid-face distribution. We do know V1 is fairly risky. And then the, the, the people I worry about the most are actually the ones that have birthmarks that are on both sides of their faces or can be, are, are, in my, in my experience, almost always end up with glaucoma. Um, this is a picture of a 14-year-old patient of, well, at the time, 14-year-old patient of mine with glaucoma. And you can see these are pictures of her optic nerves um, collecting the, the retina and the vessels um, to take those signals to the brain. You can see the choroidal hemangioma on that right eye. And you can see that the divot in the optic nerve on the right eye is bigger than the left. Now this is still a fairly healthy looking optic nerve, but she has glaucoma here. And luckily we caught it super early when she just has that tiny little change compared to the other eye. So the way we evaluate a patient with glaucoma depends on their age and their cooperation. There's a lot we can do in the clinic now um, with photos and with um, different types of pressure measuring devices that don't require drops, which really the kids don't like. Um, and so uh, we can use a tono pen, but that often needs um, to, but we can use it lined up, but it often needs um, anesthetic. This is a picture of the, how they use it in veterinary clinics. I guess Dr. Metri and I um, got the message that we needed to have veterinary um, stories in our, in our, in our uh, uh, talks today. Although I was very tickled to see the goose in glasses. That was funny. The eye care kind of revolutionized the way we treat kids because before we used to have to take every, almost every baby at least over the age of six months till about three and a half years old to the operating room to check their pressure under anesthesia. Cause if they're crying, the pressure is going to be higher than it actually is. The eye care, which looks like this, but we always say, yeah, yeah, right. Usually you're trying to chase down the toddler gives us a quick measurement without using any drops. And it may not be exactly accurate to what the pressure in the eye is, but nothing really is. And it gives us some internal consistency. So it'll tell us if the pressure is very high. It'll tell us if the pressure is asymmetric along with other signs. And we can make a decision about whether that child needs anesthesia. Um, this is just a, a more complicated device that we use typically in the operating room with our pediatric patients, but some of you who are adult patients may see this being used on you as well. 
And then Goldman applination for ophthalmologists is typically the gold standard. As the children and adults get older and are able to do this, this is what we do with that um, yellow liquid and the blue light. And actually that picture on the left-hand side of your screen is what we're looking at to figure out what your pressure is. So if you ever wondered what it looks like to us, it's that picture where we try to match up the Myers and it'll tell us the pressure. Um, corneal thickness can affect the pressure reading and the analogy is always, if you have a beach ball and a basketball, a, a beach ball and a soccer ball filled to the same pressure, the walls are thicker on the soccer ball than the beach ball. So everything we do depends on how thick that cornea is. So we will definitely measure that on all of our patients at least once in their lifetime. That this is how that's done. This is just to show you the kinds of devices and things that you might encounter either yourselves or your children in clinic. Gonioscopy is done with that little lens. Um, we have to do it before it, the child is dilated or before the patient is dilated. And often in Sturge Weber, you'll see a stripe of blood in the drainage system. Not that it's leaking into the eye, but you'll see it behind the drainage system because everything's backed up and congested. And this is just a picture um, of what a normal drainage system looks like. And these are just pretty, pretty pictures that I like to show. I think they're cool, but everyone else might not. Um, other functional tests, so that's, that's all kind of um, part of the exam. The other thing we really focus on once we have a patient or we're worried about a patient that has glaucoma is serial testing. So there's really, we can do structural testing and we can do functional testing. Visual fields are the only way to do functional testing. And that is what the patient is seeing over time. We look for change there. It, it can get messy in folks that have neurologic conditions and overlays as well. And um, to be able to determine how much is related to glaucoma and how much may be related to a neurologic lesion, but it's helpful for both the neurologist and the ophthalmologist to know if there are changes and if they're progressing. OCT is um, ocular, and this is what a visual field might look like in a glaucoma patient. The black is the area that's missing. It always tells us how well they do taking the test. Um, OCT or optical coherence tomography is the easiest way to conceptualize this. It's like a light-based ultrasound. So it gives us structural images down to three to five micron resolution of the optic nerve and other parts of the eye. In particular for Sturge Weber, we use this, we can do enhanced depth imaging of the choroid and the hemangioma if there's involvement. We can do imaging of the front part of the eye, like in this picture of the cornea and the iris. You can see there in this trauma patient, the iris is plastered up to the cornea on the one side, blocking the drainage system. And this is what those out overlays look like. So you'll see this as you come in for your glaucoma checks, and we can then check those thickness measurements year to year to see if things are changing. Ultrasound sometimes we use, you can see here a thickened choroid in this ultrasound patient. You see those, um, that kind of hex honeycomb appearance to the choroid there. Um, and sometimes we use that to figure out how thick the hemangioma is or if there's an overlying retinal detachment. Um, disc photos are really helpful in my young children. Often with bribery of lollipops, we can get nice pictures. And here you can see a patient with glaucoma. Um, these are stereo photos, so they're in duplicate and we can use a stereo viewer to look at them. And you can see that this patient has much worse glaucoma than the picture I showed you earlier because the right nerve on this patient has just a very thin rim of tissue and a big cup in the middle compared to the left versus this is the picture I showed you before. So you can see this Sturge Weber patient has early glaucoma and this patient has much more advanced glaucoma. These are just summary slides because there's a lot of different medications that we use for glaucoma. And I'm sure uh, Julia wants to make this available to you guys. I've gone ahead and at least for the United States, we have um, standards for the, the colors of the caps for the drops. So each class has its own cap. These are all the different glaucoma drops and typically how many times a day they're used, although there's some variation in that as well. Sometimes we use them more or less often, um, but I thought it might be a good reference for um, y'all to see, you know, in case your insurance wants to switch things around to make sure it's in the same class, or if you get a generic, for example, Travitan has gone generic. So now everyone's getting Travaprost. Combigan has gone generic, so you might get bromelanine and timolol instead. And that is it for glaucoma. I didn't cover the retinal manifestations of Sturge Weber because I think you guys would be really tired of hearing about eyeballs, but maybe we can alternate that for the next time. 
It's much rarer to have retinal detachments and uh, much more common to have glaucoma. We do get a question every now and then about it, but I appreciate it because it, that was a lot to take into, which is great. <laughs> and um, no, I, and it's, if you don't mind sharing that slide, that would be great. Sure. I'll email you the PowerPoint and you can um, take it out because um, it, it, the really nice, the really cool thing is, is there's been a lot of focus on episcleral venous pressure um, more recently in research and mechanism of action for some of these medications. And so there's a trial ongoing right now that's in phase two for a new glaucoma drop. And they're actually enrolling one arm is a very small arm enrolling Serge Weber patients because the mechanism of action is on the vasculature. So um, that'll be really interesting to see if that pans out and comes to market. It'll be the first medication that we have actually on label for Sturge Weber because everything else is off label. Most of what I do is off label for everything. So. The one thing I do want to also add is as patients, um, just know it's per very particular. Like if you get something that's working, try to stay with it. <laughs> like with all of our meds, because I know that changing one drop doesn't seem like a lot for the insurance company, but um, in our world, it could change control. And and Correct. so that's always a critical piece because I know that um, we do we get those questions every especially at the at beginning of the year right with new insurance companies and so forth. So um, I know Linda, you have a question because you had something here in the box, but I know you had some questions. Yes. Um, so my daughter's twenty nine now, and she had you know, identified the glaucoma when she was, was, um, it was congenital with her, um, in just the right eye with Sturge Weber. Um, and she just last year, she just lost the vision in that eye, um, permanently from high pressure. However, um, just before Christmas, her left eye is completely unaffected. There's no glaucoma there. Her pressures are like 17. It's beautiful. Um, but she started losing vision in that eye as well. And she just described it as like a gray curtain coming over the top of her eye. And she already has that. Um, she only has half a field of vision in that eye anyway from, you know, she had a hemispherectomy 17 years ago. She had herniated brainstem and all of that. So now this new vision loss is terrifying because we don't know, they don't know what it's from. They, they did do an ultrasound, like you said, to look at that choroid to see if it, and they thought it might be a little bit thickened, which is really unusual because she doesn't have any other vasculature in her eye from Sturge Weber. So okay. do you have any insights into that? Um, can you tell me if it was like a top down or a side to side loss? I, I'm assuming the hemi Hemi field is side mm -hmm. to side, but was it yes, a top so down? Side to side. Yes, it was a top down, like a curtain coming down. Okay. And has she seen a neuro ophthalmologist? Um, yes. And okay. they, they looked at her brain. They looked at the optic and nerve. Does they she, looked everywhere. Does she have issues with clotting or anything like that in general? Um, she did just in her arms have some superficial blood clots in probably, I want to say like 10, 12 years ago. Um, and she has many little lipomas in her arms that are, you know, they feel like blood clots, but they, they just call them lipomas. Yeah. Did they mm -hmm. look in, did they do an MRI of the orbits to look behind the eyes? Yes, they did. Okay. And, and it was all normal. Oh, that's a shame. I don't know that I would have done much differently. You know, the only thing is there's not a whole lot of evidence for lowering the pressure and seeing if that prevents any further loss. But in some patients where you have kind of um, what you presume to be a vascular compression or some sort of type issue with the optic nerve, we will lower the pressure of the eye just to aid perfusion. So if you lower the pressure gradient in the eye, theoretically, the blood flow gets in there better. Um, okay. Like less than 17, 19? Yeah. I mean, if she had the issue oh. at 17 and 19, I would drop her down to 11 or 12 as long as oh. she's tolerating the drops well, because I don't know what else to do. Right. I don't know that that yeah. would prevent her right. from more vision, but I don't think it would hurt. Um, okay. And that's kind of the conversation I have. It usually ends up being a conversation in, in patients a little bit older that have had like kind of mini strokes to the optic nerve or they have uh, other kind of optic nerve anomalies where you know they're gonna be at higher risk for having problems, but you have no idea what, how the pressure plays into it. Um, mm -hmm. 
But if she tolerated the eye drops well for the other eye, there's not a whole lot of downside to using them in this one, just to say we tried. I don't know that it would prevent something necessarily, but it might. Okay. Which, which drops would do that? Cause she's, she's on a combination now. Um, they switched her to Timolol and I'm sorry, I cannot remember the name of it. It starts with an M, um, which combination Timolol and this other medication to, to drop it from when it was at 50 and. Oh, uh, Timolol is mm-hmm. usually, at least in the U S Timolol is usually with dorzolamide or with bromonidine. The second one. <laughs> oh, so yeah, that's, that's Combigan. It's generic. It's gone generic. I think, okay. I mean, if you're, if you're already using that in the other eye, you can use it once a day in the, in the good eye, it's not going to cause any trouble. Some people end up getting an allergy to the bromonidine over time, but that's not vision mm-hmm. threatening. Okay. We will try that then. Thank you very much. I hope it helps. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> we have just two more questions. I promise, Laura. Sure. We'll... <laughs> Annette, I know you have a question there. Are you there? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Blight, and we appreciate you being here. Um, we have a question. Uh, we also post it, uh, ask the other doctor also. So after she, she is five years post op. Uh, left functional hemispherectomy. She was weaned off of Kepra recently. And about five days later, a teacher had noticed that her eye, which is the side affected, um, actually it's this side, <laughs> but um, was dilated and the other eye was not. Um, our concern is, was it seizures? Uh, that's been pretty much knocked out. So is it something that could be being caused by glaucoma? Um, Her precious, I'm I'm sorry. I was going to let you know. Sorry about that to jump in. Her pressures did go up. They were at 20 this time versus, um, what was it? 15 the last time. Yeah. Is she, has she only got the hemangioma on the, where is her hemangioma? On the left side. On the left side. So, um, She's high risk for glaucoma. I mean, in general. So I'd watch the pressures. That's, I don't, I don't like dropping a Sturge Weber patient too low that, that gets into other retina issues sometimes, but 20, 20, I would start to watch if she goes into the mid to high twenties, I'd probably treat it. Um, It's important that she has, if she doesn't already have updated visual fields, because that left, um, hemispherectomy is going to affect her visual fields and it's going to be harder to follow her for glaucoma going forward. I don't think the pupil finding is related to the glaucoma, glaucoma, not without, not unless she was having pain. However, um, if, does she get migraine? Does she get headaches? So here's our situation with that is Brielle barely has pain at all. Like she got hurt the other day, her entire kneecap is black and blue. Okay. She didn't cry or anything. This is the situation we're having is she doesn't feel pain. Okay. So I would probably treat that left eye presumptively for pressure because I would be concerned not having seen the eye. If they just noted the pupil was a slightly irregular shape. Although usually with a high pressure that doesn't typically happen unless it's an angle closure, which is kind of the picture of that old lady I showed you. Um, I will tell you though, that with migraine, you can get uh, uneven pupils. So you can get a pupil dilate with migraine. So it could it be related to seizures. Yeah. Cause that's like a whole spectrum. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's more classically associated with people who get migraine. Okay. So that's I would so- just watch at this point, I would just watch close, but I wouldn't necessarily panic about the unequal pupils. Okay. Okay. And um, one quick more question, prism glasses, what do you think for kids with left functional hemispherectomy? Um, they can be very helpful for anybody with a, with a visual field cut because it helps them pull that into the center of what they're looking at. Okay, thank you and we appreciate mm-hmm. you. Sure. Last, last one, Ma, Mo, thank you, I'm so yeah. sorry, terrible. Yeah, no problem, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lauren, for the for your presentation and advice also for the different types of uh, glaucoma. Uh, actually, for my son, uh, we did the regular eye pressure for him every six months mm-hmm. until until he reached to the seven years old. 
and on the area of the or the affective area, which is the right side area, we found that he start the high pressure on his eyes. It reached to 29, 30, 31. Then we start with the combination of the medications, the mm -hmm. eye drops. We reach up to four different eye drops on different periods. Then the decision of the specialist that uh, to do a surgery for him. So we did for him the implant of Ahmed Val. Mm -hmm. And uh, his pressure, we did that uh, two years back. And uh, since that day, every time we are doing his eye pressure, uh, it shows that it is between 12 to 13 to 14. Uh, my question, doctor, such type of valves, for how much period it can last? Well, we put them in, we've been using those types of implants for about 35 years. Um, they can go a really long time. Um, however, the, the younger the person gets them, the more risk because they have to live with them longer that there's gonna need to be a revision due to the actual implant itself. So sometimes because it's silicone and you put the tube in kind of angled, it'll kind of straighten out on its own and have to be moved or recovered or it's rare, but it happens. Um, the, I always tell my patients two things. One, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter what kind of glaucoma patient they are. One, I don't care how we get to stable as long as we get to stable. So we can do drops, laser or surgery or any combination of the three. The other thing I tell them is that the most the biggest risk, the most common thing that will happen when you treat a glaucoma patient is that over time, something else will have to be done to control the disease. And so you've already done it. You went through all the drops, you had the implant, it's working well. He could very well end up back on drops. He could very well end up with more surgery in his lifetime. It's just the nature of the disease. And it's analogous to kind of treating a diabetic. You have to control the sugar. The diabetes never really, you can't just wave a magic wand and get rid of it but you have to control the sugar to prevent damage. In glaucoma, you have to control the pressure to prevent damage. And you have to take that person their whole life, hopefully keeping the vision that they have. The other question, doctor, when, 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 when the damage will happen uh, in concern with the pressure, what's the period? Or there is no certain period? It depends on the patient. It depends Typically, on the patient. Yeah. Traditionally, in uh, Serge Weber, we call it bimodal. So traditionally, they have issues kind of up until the age of four or five, and that's when the eye stretches, and then they kind of calm down, and then they start having problems again traditionally, big caveat there, like 20s and 30s, okay? What I will tell you <laughs> is um, there's something that happens at just before the onset of puberty with hormonal changes that causes the pressure to go up and causes things to get out of whack. And um, if you ask people that have treated kids who are my mentors that are much, that have decades of experience, they'll, oh yeah, they do that. So what I typically do is I'll get them stable when they're younger and I'll see them every six months or so, such as your son is doing. And then probably when your son gets to about 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I start seeing those kids more often like every three to four months, because oh. the pressure can go up without you knowing. And it's related to these, this hormonal thing that happens at the onset of adolescence. Also, if they the need steroid for any reason, they need to get their pressure checked. Like if they need steroid for their seizure control or something else, they need to get their pressures checked. The question here, doctor, let us see. I will, I will ask the question in a different way. Uh, if the pressure will be increased, uh, the, 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 the nerve of, of the, what's the period that this nerve or this uh, arterial will be damaged? Let us see if the pressure will be increased in one oh, day, okay. in two day, and three day. Right. So, nerve... so typically glaucoma happens, the damage from glaucoma happens slowly over time. So you have, you're going to have people living in the 30s right? Pressures of thirties for a while. They don't know that they have glaucoma and the damage happens slowly over months to years, mm -hmm. but different mm -hmm. people are susceptible in different ways. Traditionally, it's been taught that like the higher the pressure, 
the shorter time there is to damage, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we start getting really worried about pressure when you get into the 40s because you're working against the ability of the eye to perfuse itself. So that's when people start having um, mini strokes and things in the eyes. So basically you are recommending once, once let us say, in, 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 in the stage of syndrome patients, once they are getting older, so the test period should be uh, more shorter every three, four months. Yes, yes, because of the hormonal changes. One more thing, Dr. Thank Blythe, you, Doctor. they just asked, and, and I promise you, um, it, the hormonal changes, do you also see this in menopause? We don't know. <laughs> We're working that. on that. <laughs> Actually, um, the Serge Weber Foundation has given one of our star residents who just matched for his glaucoma fellowship, um, and we are doing the study in actually uh, menstruating women at the moment. And then we'll look at menopausal women. And then the, the problem is we don't know exact. We know that steroid, like cortisol and oral steroids, prednisone, we know that affects pressure. But what we've noticed in our patients is this onset of adolescence spike. We've also noticed, I've noticed in patients who have been on testosterone supplementation or androgen supplementation, sometimes their pressures will go up. We don't know exactly which hormones are involved. And estrogen's kind of like up in the air. Plus there are other hormones that come into play with menopause. There are higher levels of androgens that are involved there. So I haven't seen it as dramatically like in my adult glaucoma patients who I've been taking care of for a while in their forties and then fifties and sixties. I haven't seen the same phenomenon. People don't talk about it as much with the perimenopausal menopausal women as much. Um, but, but we don't really know. I, I would think less risky, but I'm not sure. Well, that's it. I promise. We're done. Okay. It's, Thank you. it's okay. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. Well, I knew it kind of went with the other yeah. piece and um, that's why I quick threw it in there. I was hoping you didn't mind. Um, but no, thank you for always coming on and doing what you do. And um, thank you to everyone else. I know we kept everybody about 20 minutes extra. Um, we are coming back in April. I think the one-off talk is going to be about pharmacology. So, and then we have some other things that we're going to talk about. So come back in April, but thank you for today. And I hope you all have a great afternoon. Bye everybody. Really, really thank you. Really thank you. Of course. I really appreciate the, 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 this, this summit and what we got additional information about it. Julia, please uh, share with us all the presentations and uh, the link in order to participate on that. Of course. I have to oh. get some approvals first. They like when I get approvals. So once okay. I get those, they're all yours. Okay? Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Julia. But, but you, Julia, Julia, I sure I need the presentation of Dr. Jeffrey. Okay. This one, I should have it because he bought my son photo once he was three years old. He did? <laughs> He did, yes. It is the first photo. <laughs> yeah, which one is that? Uh, which one is your son? It's the first photo in his presentation. Oh, I think I have that presentation. I'll find it and get it for you. Please. Thank All you. right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you.